Hello, everyone, and welcome to this fabulous, amazing panel on historical fiction and Asian American authors. Um, I'm so happy to be moderating this. Um, I am Eileen Wong Gregorio, or I.W. Gregorio, um, and um, I want to get right to the real stuff, which is to introduce these incredible um, people who've written um, diverse, um, complex, compelling books that you guys are all going to want to read. So I'm going to actually go through and introduce these people in the order of the chronology um, of their books, where they sort of fit within the historical setting. So I'm going to start off with Makia Lucier. Born and raised in Guam, Makia Lucier's disclaimed novels include A Death Struck Year set in Oregon during the Spanish flu pandemic, and her forthcoming historical fantasy, Year of the Reaper, is set just after the 14th century Black Death. So no relevance right now during a pandemic at all. Okay. So next um, is the luminous Stacy Lee, who's the New York Times bestselling and multiple award-winning author of Under a Painted Sky, Outrun the Moon, Downstairs Girl, and most recently, Luck of the Titanic. Her middle grade debut, Winston Chu versus the Whimsies, is forthcoming in 2022 from Rick Riordan Presents. And just for posterity, her earliest book that I know of was set in 1849. So you can see already that you know, these, these, these ladies have, have it all covered. Next is Kylie Lee Baker, who's an Atlanta area writer getting her master's in library and information science. The debut novel, The Keeper of the Night, described as a haunting and compulsively readable dark fantasy set in 1980s Japan, is forthcoming this October from Inkyard Press slash HarperCollins. Um, next, award-winning author Padma Venkatraman's debut, Climbing the Stairs, was set in India during World War II. She is also the author of the acclaimed novel, Islands End, A Time to Ant Dance, and The Bridge Home. And her list of awards fills up like an entire Wikipedia page, so beware. Um, so Kathleen Birkinshaw is the daughter of a Hiroshima survivor. And her Crystal Kite award-winning debut novel, The Last Cherry Blossom, is the United Nations Office for Disarmament and Affairs resource for teachers and students. Last but last not least, um, Amy M. Lee was born in Vietnam and had been immigrated to the U.S. in 1980 at the age of five with her mother and cousin. Her debut novel, Snow in Vietnam, which was a finalist for the Pacific Northwest Writers Association Book Award, is a tribute to her mother's heroic decision to flee Vietnam after the fall of Saigon. And it's set in the 1970s which makes me feel very old because that's when I was born. So, um, so I'm gonna start off um, by number one, saying how much I admire all of you um, for writing historical fiction, because I truly believe that it's one of the hardest genres to master. And the amount of research that you guys have poured into your books is daunting um, and really inspiring. Um, and as someone who is sort of trying to work on a historical fantasy medical thriller, like I, I, I personally want to know. So what are your tips? What are your secrets? What steps do you take during the process? And are you the type of people who write first and then research along the way? Or do you research and like start off with an idea and then start to write? So I don't know who went, that's a big question. Um, and uh, I'm going to start with Makia. Sure. So with me, it really it depends on the book. Um, with my first book, which was just pure historical fiction set during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, it, I started with the pandemic and I just kind of built a story around that whole, that whole pandemic, that whole chaotic year. Um, but with other stories, my second book was based on medieval map makers. So that's what I started with. I started with people and then built a story all around that particular subject. So you focus on one core subject and you kind of research out until, until you build a world. Um, and then with my current book, it was about, I was curious about the aftermath of the Black Death, about how the survivors went on to live their life after you know all those millions of people died. So that's where I started. And then again, built around that. So it's just, it's just kind of a puzzle putting that whole world into one cohesive story. Um, how about you, Kathleen? 
Um, well, for mine, because my mother was the Hiroshima survivor, I tried to put some events um, that she went through in her life. And then I tried to research from there what was happening around that time to see if they could kind of fit in together. And I, I'm very much a paper and pen kind of person. So I did like this one big long timeline that the paper went like across my dining room table. And then I could kind of put in a little post-it notes, you know, um, different things about her family. And then um, what I really wanted to make sure I included that was happening because it was like the last year of World War II. So just trying to put all that in. And so for me, the timeline was really helpful as I was trying to do my research and kind of keeping things because with a post-it note, if you needed to move something around, it was much easier to kind of play around with, with my mother's actual things that happen. You can play with her timeline a little bit. I love post-it notes. How about you, Kylie? <laughs> so for The Keeper of Night, I researched a lot as I was writing, but also that is historical fantasy. So I do have a little more leeway in terms of what I can get away with. And another big thing is that helped me is that the book starts off in Victorian England, which is a setting that me and a lot of other people are already pretty familiar with. So I wasn't starting from zero. Like I think most, me and most readers can picture what a street in Victorian London looks like. And so I could easily just start writing that scene and then look up details as they became relevant. Like what kind of shampoo did they have to use back then? How do you, uh, get on a ferry to France, things like that. And then when the story actually moved into Japan, I did have to do a lot more research just to get a picture of what an average street would look like. Um, but in my case, those scenes in the real world were pretty transient. It was like we come to Japan and then we go into the underworld where I obviously don't have to do a lot of research. But I think if I were writing a book which was more grounded in the real world, even if it was historical fantasy, which is the case for the book I'm trying to write now, I would definitely need to do a lot more research ahead of time. Like I'm writing a book about ancient China and I have a stack of books right here that I can't even lift. It's like this tall and I want to read all that before I even write chapter one. Definitely. Um, so Stacy, what have you learned in your five books? Yeah, you know, I have realized, and I don't know if others feel this way, but I've realized that I come to my subject matters not necessarily being interested in them to begin with. It's always like the possibility of a story that draws me in. And in this case, for luck of the Titanic, learning that there were actually Chinese men sailing on the Titanic, which was like a mind blowing thing. My mother-in-law sent me this article a couple of years ago. And, and I was like, whoa, that, that actually happened and people didn't know that happened. So, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't like one of those big Titanic fans. I didn't see the movie like thousands of times like people did. So I cut and I, I get very seasick. So I mean like sailing, shipping, I don't know, not really my thing, but I wanted to write this story. And so I sort of kind of dragged kicking and screaming to learn about the Titanic. Um, and then once I got there, it was fascinating. You know, that always happens to me. I am dragged into the subject matter and then I tried to do my best to learn about it. And as with most things, once you get to know something, you develop an interest in it. So that's definitely the case um, for me. Uh, I usually have to figure out the lay of the land. And in this case, you know, whether that's by purchasing a map and um, going over that, in this case, it was getting a blueprint which the blueprint measured like as big as my uh, dining room table. And I poured over that and tried to figure out um, all the different decks and all that. <laughs> so that's where I started. Nice. Yeah. And then finally, um, Amy, how about you? Um, so obviously your, your story was very personal. Um, and so you, did you have a different approach to it, do you think? You know, a lot of, uh, so the Vietnam War is the backdrop for mine, but, and even though so many people knew about the Vietnam War, they didn't really understand what happened after the war ended and what happened to um, the boat refugees. And so for me, it was really the process of interviewing and traveling to get my story right. Um, it wasn't necessarily reading a lot. Of, I mean, I did read a lot of books and I did watch documentaries and that kind of stuff, but um, I also interviewed war veterans and boat refugees um, to write that story, the first one. And unlike Kathleen, 
I'm not a plotter, I'm a panther. And so I fly by the seat of my pants. I tried putting a timeline together with sticky notes and everything on the board. And it just kind of, you know, I let the story and the characters kind of dictate where I was going to go with it. So yeah, we all have our styles for sure. I think that one of, um, I think it's really amazing for me to see how differently you guys all get to this do something that's very similar. Um, Padma, did you want to speak about this question at all? Or do you want to take a pass on it? Um, I could quickly hop in to say that um, I was an oceanographer. So unlike uh, Stacy, I don't get seasick. But that means also that I came from a very different place when I started writing my first novel, Climbing the Stairs. And I didn't think of it as, you know, writing historical fiction or anything. I think I could put this in front of my face to be seen. But what happened was I was going through the process of becoming an American citizen because I moved here on my own when I was 19. So that's very different, I think, from, um, you know, a lot of other experiences. And when I thought about that, you know, did I want to become an American citizen? The question in my mind was uh, that suddenly America's wars would be my wars. I wasn't just taking what was good in this country. I was also going to be taking on this country's history. And when I started to think about that, my mind went back to this very different time and place, right? India in the 1940s. But when my own family, people in my own family had asked this question, and um, one of those people was my grand uncle, who in the 1940s was a soldier in the Allied forces. And I started to realize that although Mahatma Gandhi's uh, contributions are very well recognized as they should be, uh, unfortunately, there is a whole lot of this whole a swath of people who have been just absolutely forgotten by history and not honored, who were the Indian soldiers who fought on the Allied side, because everybody thinks World War II soldier, white guy. Um, and that is so wrong, right? There's so many people of color in our country today as well who have fought and died and they're not honored. And so I started to think about that and then suddenly I had this image that was on the hardcover of the novel, which is just of this girl standing at the foot of a staircase that she was not allowed to climb just because she was female. She was told she had to stay downstairs uh, where the kitchen was and wasn't allowed to go upstairs to the library. And that's when I started realizing in a way I was writing not just my uncle's story, but my mom's story because that had happened to her. And you know, hearing Makia speak of the Black Death, my mother has actually lived through plague scares in India. So when this pandemic started, she said to me, it is not the plague, you know? Um, and given what is happening in India right now, recently she said to me, it feels like that. And so I think there was this very deep personal connection like um, so many others have expressed with this story. But for me, the starting point with uh, research was speaking to family, looking at photographs, reading letters and all of this sort of personal gathering and then, of course, also doing you know tons of um, of research after these people became sort of characters in my mind. So books, books, books galore about World War II, which I never thought I would read. The the pressure for that, the responsibility that you're you're taking that you're taking the step to represent, right? So tell me, Padma, you you discussed that. Um, the depth that you need to go to to be able to represent accurately, and I feel like you you guys all must have stories about that and about and that where uniquely as women of color you're, you're you're looking at the history through a very different lens than than other people do, and um, I'm wondering how whether you guys consciously um, write your books from your perspective, and and of course some would argue that you couldn't not that um, and everything, the personal is political, and particularly as women of colors, color, anything that we write is is viewed through a different lens. So um, does anyone want to talk about whether you feel that there's more pressure or responsibility to um, provide accurate representation, especially given that so many of these stories have not been told? Okay, Stacey. <laughs> I feel like I should jump in here. Um, 
I, authenticity, you know, I, for me, I know I try to write heroines who go against the stereotypes that we have grown up with. And so for me, that's my thing. That's what I want to do because those stereotypes have hurt us so much. And, you know, you've seen the Atlanta shootings. We all know what happened there. Um, so, and I'll, I know the few books that I came across with Asian American women in them growing up, they were all playing to these stereotypes, the depictions in movies, et cetera. So for me, all my heroines have to play against that stereotype. And then, uh, and it's hopefully not done in uh, an artificial way because these are, you know, people are, just many layers of different things. So I try to make my heroines um, like strong and um, clever and inventive. And uh, certainly that was the case with the heroine in this book, Valera, she's an acrobat. Um, and I made her very independent because she, she, has to, she wants to go and um, find her brother and convince him to go to America via the Ringling Brothers Circus. And it takes a certain personality to do that. Um, I think I, if there's anything historians accuse me of, it, it's that, oh, well, these, these girls wouldn't have, have really existed, that women wouldn't have done these things. But I, I always take issue with that. So um, as you can see in reading my books. So for me, it's always to do something that's uh, counter to those stereotypes. I love that. I'm going to hop in really quick, if I may, and just stay because I have been a fan, as Stacey knows, uh, ever since her first novel came out. And the arguments that I have is, OK, my novel, Climbing the Stairs, is based on a real human being. My mom is older than Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and she was a lawyer in India, you know, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg wasn't limited to downstairs. Yes. Hello. So when people say these things to uh, authors of color like Stacey, mm -hmm. that these uh, people wouldn't have existed. Um, they are really buying into that stereotype because I believe that strong women have always existed. I was forced to do all sorts of things when I was growing up in India and I, uh, you know, <laughs> That's spoke right. out and stood up against them. And I don't think that to say just because you were in a culture that was maybe macho or oppressive, you were not intelligent. That just doesn't fit. And the other thing that I think that I fight very strong, I fought very strongly with Climbing the Stairs, but also with the two historical fiction novels that I'm um, or looking at now, or in progress writing now, is this idea of, um, you know, colonialism, especially British colonialism has been sort of watered down and people think, oh, uh, they brought you so much, right? And all this kind of nonsense. And, uh, you know, all I have to say is this book, it is a nonfiction book written for adults in the era of darkness, which is about the British in India. And I think all over the world, people who have been and lived through colonial times, like my mom, know what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is always this white narrative uh, of it's not that bad, you know, we hear it now um, with re reference to race issues in this country, right? a few bad apples and this sort of thing is so damaging and I think it's so important whoever you are to understand uh, what the cruelty has been not because it's pointing fingers not to accuse anyone but to understand collectively where we come from and how cruelty has unfortunately shaped uh, racism or injustices that continue to perpetrate or be perpetrated in our world today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Padma. Um, Amy, you had something to say? Well, I, I wanna echo what Stacey and Padma just said because uh, I applaud you both. And if I could stand up and give you a standing ovation right now, I totally would. I think that's the problem, right? We have so many, in so many years, have had the white narrative, different, different people telling our story at the outsider lens. And it's important now, it's our obligation now, I think, um, to accurately represent our people and our history and to write it. And if it's not us, then who? Uh, we can't continue to let other foreigners or outsiders write our story. Because I remember growing up, um, 
I felt really deaf, dumb, and mute whenever people asked me what my perspectives were on the Vietnam War and what did I know about my, um, my heritage and how I came to the States. And so now, um, you know, I'm at an age where I'm starting to be curious, definitely more curious about my background. And um, I don't have anybody to, to ask questions to. So it's, I take it upon myself to write that story. And I hope everybody else does that too. If you get to that stage where you're curious about your heritage and, and your history, please start unearthing it. Don't let somebody else do it for you. I love that. Kathleen? Um, I know that when I was talking with my mom, she made a point of telling me, don't depict me as someone who always loves being in kimonos and played the koto and was always very genteel. She says, I was not that way. Um, and she said, you know, she had an aunt that was that way, but she wasn't. And as the more that I started learning more about what her history was, I think back to when I was younger, when people would say to me when they found out my mother was in Japan and they would say, you know, was she ready to kill Americans when they came? And I'm just like, that is not the story, that that is not really what happened. And that's when I really decided that I really wanted to show what the people in the culture were like at that time. So they could kind of get a feel for it and separate some of the things that whatever the soldiers may be doing from the people that are there and the citizens that were living there at that time. And so that was really important to me. And I'm so glad that my mom in the beginning said, you know, don't make me to sound better than I was <laughs> because, and, and I realized how much of a strength that was and how it then actually led to how she reacted to certain um, things that actually did happen to her. But I found that it was really important to kind of set, as we're all saying, to say, this is what the story is. and. For the sequel that I'm doing, and it's dealing a lot with the allied occupation that's there after the war and, and a lot of the secrecy and censorship about the atomic bombing. And it's stories that people don't normally hear about. And I think for all of us, our stories in a history book, if it's in a history book, is maybe a paragraph, maybe a few sentences. Um, and we, we so need to go beyond that. And I think that's what all of these ladies have been doing. And I think it's wonderful. Um, and for any upcoming authors for doing the same kind of thing, it's, it's just so important to show it in a different light. So I love that. Makia? So I was just struck right now by what Amy said about being curious about your own background. So I think we're, we're similar ages, I'm 45. And every May, it's Asian American Pacific Islander Month. And I'm like, I feel kind of sometimes like the token Pacific Islander, because I'm always looking around saying, where are the other Pacific Islander writers? Where are we? It, it is so hard to find us. Someone should write a story about us. Someone should tell our stories. And I thought, well, maybe I should write the story, you know, there's, it just, so why not? So I've been the very, I'm in the first draft stage of writing the story that's gonna be about home and it's gonna be about the Pacific and it's gonna be about our mythology and our history and just our family. And it's just gonna be, and it's my way of trying to understand my own history and, you know, being able to offer for other Pacific Islanders out there who look around and can't find these stories, you know, to offer them something to read, you know, a story that they can recognize. So. I love that. I mean, I, I, I want to sort of reiterate to me how wondrous it is to be moderating this panel because this is a panel that certainly never would have existed when I was growing up um, when Asian American literature was Amy Tan, right? a very specific story and a very specific demographic within the Asian diaspora, which is so huge, huge to a point where I don't think I even realized, like, I, I, I mean, growing up where I did, I don't feel like I even met my first Filipino American friend until college, right? Um, and being exposed to the diversity within the diversity within Asian Americans and seeing the the spread in literature, the fact that we can read Thai, Thai American stories now, we can read Filipino American stories, Pacific Islander stories. It's, it's really, really incredible. And um, that's one of the things that, one of the things that you, you're each doing in your own stories is, is, ta is um, obviously representing an area of the world um, that probably a lot of people gloss over. Um, and so 
the next question is a little bit about um, how to represent how to the complexity of the diversity within the diaspora when you are choosing your time periods and geographical locations. Um, just because so many people do have this idea of Asia as a monolith, but we know that there are so many different ethnic groups, religious beliefs, viewpoints on mental health, sexuality, gender roles, et cetera. Anyone want to pick that one up? I'll, I'll go. Okay. I think part of the answer is in your question, Eileen, uh, in terms of complexity, because here's an example. You can be Chinese living in Vietnam, not knowing the Vietnamese language, never having been to China, you know, but you have your own story. You have a voice, you have a narrative, and you need to, to write it. And I think um, trying to accurately represent um, the diversity within our, uh, within our communities is something that we will always have to struggle with. And until more and more of us start to um, share our stories, there's always going to be that two-dimensional viewpoint. You know, it's not going to be three-dimensional. We're not going to see um, all the shades of our heritage and, and um I guess what I'm really saying is there's no really concrete way to answer that question um, until all of us speak up and share our story one way or another. I will kind of pick on Kylie, if you don't mind, um, just because I know that in your story, you have two different Asian cultures. It's like, wow, what an idea to have two different Asian cultures in the same book. Are you sure it's not too much diversity? <laughs> I mean, so in, in terms of if we're thinking about showing the complexity and diversity of, you know, Asian people overall, I mean, my book is really about being mixed race. Um, so that's certainly a subset of Asian people that I think is ignored a lot in literature that isn't discussed that much. And, you know, growing up watching historical dramas or seeing other people in their their culture's traditional clothes or like when my grandmother made me a kimono and I would put it on and I would think about being in ancient China I would I would just look at myself in the mirror and think this doesn't look right because people who looked like me didn't exist back then which isn't true I mean mixed race people were certainly a lot rarer the farther back you go than they are now but they existed and they mattered and that's not something that we see a lot in literature um, historical literature, I think adding mixed race characters in some ways can make things harder if you want to get deep into their character, because if it's not the norm, it might require some backstory, but I do think it's it's worth it a lot of the time to see that kind of representation. I love it. So you guys all consciously chose to write um, for you know, young people and teens. Um, although Amy, I guess maybe your 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 books might be more older, more older adults. So so sorry, not adult. You know what? I mean. Yeah. Um, well, my two adult fictions, and then my third in the trilogy is actually young adult. Okay. So okay, let's talk about why it's important for young people to know history. Um, is there any particular lesson though I hate talking about our your books as if they're you know you know teaching points I hate I always I've always tried to shy away from the label of being an important book um, because it makes it sound like a vitamin when in fact um, I like to think of books like yours as blueberries you know they're tasty but they're also good for you so um like, how do you see your historical novels being used, say, in classrooms or, you know, to, to, to elevate discourse, I guess? Um, Makia? Sure. So I don't write my stories thinking I, I want to teach a lesson. I just want to, I like taking those little tidbits of history that fascinate me. Spanish flu, um, the Black Death, medieval map makers and just seeing if I can create an interesting story around it. Um, but I have always been interested in play 
And I think it's because I didn't have cable growing up as a kid. So I had CBS. And every Easter, CBS, there was Ben-Hur. Um, and so I watched it, all three and a half hours of Ben-Hur. And there's this scene where Ben-Hur goes to this leper colony and sees his leprosy family. And it's just that I was six years old when I first saw that. And we just first started being fascinated by, by pandemics because pandemics, they don't play favorites. They don't care if you're black and white, black or white, rich or poor, a rotten person or a good person. You know, pandemics affect everyone. Um, so with my latest book, which takes place right after the Black Death, I just wanted to be able to show younger readers that we have been here before. We have suffered through pandemics before. We have survived before. We have gone on to lead, you know, promising, wonderful lives. And just to show that we've had so much loss lately that I just wanted to show a story that was about hope, that was about um, resiliency, really. So that was that was my main goal. That's beautiful. Kathleen, did you? Or Amy, Amy, did you? Amy, I think you're first. Uh, you know, so my third book is a young adult uh, novella, and the theme in that is really more about mental health and identity crisis. You know, you are straddling two different cultures, and um, how do you navigate that when, you know, your parents are telling you one thing and society is telling you another thing. And I hope that um, by reading these stories and being able to bring them into the classroom, that um, the kids will be more bold and more curious to understand what, what their family background is. Um, and I think also that because I grew up with not knowing anything about the Vietnamese culture and the Vietnam War and everything, that it's our responsibility as, as Asian Americans, which is the fastest growing community in the United States, um, that it's our responsibility to bring those stories to the forefront. And even if my, some of my books are, are adult fictions, there's a way to bring it down to the young adult readers or to the, the kids. You know, I go to schools and I speak to the kids about, um, about refugee, the, the refugee experience. So I think no matter what we write and what genre or what age group, there's a way to bring that into the classroom if you bring it down to their grade level. Definitely. Um, Kathleen, I know you have a lot of experience working in the classroom. Well, it's interesting because with mine, it really started from the seventh grade classroom because it was my daughter um, when they were learning about um, World War II. And she was in seventh grade. So this is like 10 years ago now. And she came home very, very upset. And she said, you know, they were talking about this really cool mushroom cloud but they don't know who was under it. Can you talk about who was under it, like grandma? And it really was something that opened up because my mother did not talk about it much when I was a child. She told me she was from Tokyo for many years, so I didn't even know that Hiroshima played a part. Um, and it, then when she told me, it made more sense because she had a lot of PTSD issues, but learning more about the history and being able to go in and tell it to them. And my mom was always private, but she said, you know, they're gonna be about the same age that I was when it happened. And maybe they'll relate to me better, you know? And, and she really felt that they're all gonna vote someday so they can walk away knowing that it's more than just a mushroom cloud. It's more than just a paragraph to say, and we won the war afterwards because it's just disrespects everybody who went through something and I think that that was kind of the turning point of realizing we need to bring more of this out we need to show more of a connection because if we look at history and if we don't connect with that humanity whether it's under a cloud whether it's in the Vietnam War whether it was in India then we're, we're apt to repeat it and we've seen horrific things be repeated. And I, I think that it's so important that we talk about that connection. I think all of our books really try to do that, regardless of when they happened in history, you realize how much is missing in the classroom and they're young. And I think they, I have found that when I speak to students, they said the number one thing that makes them interested in wanting to know more about other people's history, their own history or nuclear weapons is the story about the little girl in Hiroshima that I write about. And I think that, so our stories, when we use our characters, it draws them in and they realize that makes sense. 
or now I understand that, or, you know, I need to find out more about this. And it's been, it's, it just touches my heart when I see that because you, it, it just makes you feel like if you can touch one person with something and then they can take it out there and, and bring it out more then all the time that you spend writing all, all of that, it just is so worth it. Absolutely. Stacey, I think you had something to say. Oh, well, I think Kathleen said it so perfectly and beautifully is the, the importance of the, the personal story and the personal journey. And I think that's what uh, historical fiction authors absolutely contribute is that we are piquing the interest of students um, in learning these subject matters that maybe they would not have otherwise been interested in through that personal story. So I think that's the beauty of it. And um, yeah, I mean, I I've had lots of kids come up to me telling me that they had to find out a lot, they had to find out more about the 1906 earthquake, for example, without on the moon because, because of my character story. And, you know, that somehow piqued their interest. And with Makia, the plague, I mean, I love that you were interested in the plague growing up. That's, that's kind of adorable. And, but look at all the, all the people who will be, you know, more intrigued and not just because of our current pandemic, but because of, you know, there's so many reflections of that with the black plague. Yeah. So absolutely. And also the other thing historical fiction allows us to do is I think it, it necessarily requires us to think, uh, to have questions in our mind afterward. Um, you know, why, who was worthy of being saved on the Titanic and why? Or with the downstairs girl, I asked the question of, um, how do you raise your voice when you're like the lowest mem member of society and you're supposed to be hidden and nobody wants to see you, no one wants to hear from you. How do you make yourself heard? in that situation. And yeah, so I think leaving readers with questions in which they can wrestle with and hopefully inform them, like, you know, grow better from it. I think that's one of the things that uh, historical fiction writers bring to the table. Um, and I just wanted to jump in because it's funny because I was thinking of exactly what um, Stacy was saying, uh, which and I agree with Kathleen, it's the specific, the one specific character that leads you into the story, but it's also this larger general question that then can get raised. And so many of these questions are of current relevance. So, I mean, if you were, I, uh, if you are a history teacher watching this, then I think that's important as well to, you know, sort of relate it mm -hmm. to current debates. I mean, this question of violence and nonviolence which um, my book, Climbing the Stairs, is it's central to that question, um, is something that you know, we think about. It can be interpreted in so many different uh, ways, and it is very much a current question, right? It was very much a current question when I was writing uh, the book, and when the book came out in uh, whenever it was the Iraq War, I think, at that time. But you know, so I think that that, um, that connection is something that's uh, very, very important and then brings the, these issues um, to a sort of uh, place where I think everyone can own them. And I think that's important too, like not to think, which you know, we need diverse books says it all the time, but I started before them. And it was so hard initially to convince a, a, a teacher, a person, a librarian, a parent, that you do not need to be Indian to pick up climbing the stairs. You do not need to be of Chinese descent to pick up Luck of the Titanic, you know, or Downstairs Girl or Under Green Sky. And I think that's um, something that to me is so important. One thing that I just wanted to touch on, which was the previous question is also for me, it's so important that India is seen as one country now uh, but India, which many people don't know or don't understand, is it is like Europe. It is a mini continent. Um, and within India, we have each state speaks a separate language, has a separate cuisine. And so it, and our languages are more different than the European languages, uh, much more different than Spanish and German. So I think that's uh, something that is really not very well understood. And um, the final thing I want to do, because you, uh, well, Stacy knows anyway, that I love to lift up other people's books. 
And um, here is a fabulous, oh, here's a fabulous book called uh, Suitcase Full of Seaweed and More. And it is written by Janet Wong, who is an ama amazing Asian author. And it um, underlines Kylie's point. And it actually is about her own life. And it features a character who is mixed race, Chinese and Korean. So I just wanted to give a little shout out to that book, even though it is not historical fiction. And uh, yeah, and you know, I have a whole bunch of different books here, but, and by Indian authors uh, or South Asian authors as we are called now, and each of them is from a different part of, um, of the Indian subcontinent, you know? And um, that's something that is just not understood and we have different religions. We have different ethnicities. We have just different, so many differences, even though technically India is one country. Mm. Love it. Yes, amen to that. Kyla, did you have anything to add to that point? I know that you're new in your you're, you're new in your publishing, you know, process. But um, you know, why do you write for young people? Oh, I mean, that's no fair. Everyone else has answered this so well already. I mean, I definitely agree with what everyone else has been saying about um, making historical events more accessible and more interesting um, to younger people. I mean, in terms of, sorry, did you ask why we're writing for younger people? I mean, yeah. for me, for me, when I was younger, um, I guess when I was looking for young adult books, I was always looking for something a little bit, I guess, darker than what I could find. And so I always like to write for the younger me, you know, what I would have been interested in. So I think, um, can I think about this a little and get back to you? Of course. Sorry. I'm going to ask sort of like one of the more fun trivia um, questions, which is um, what surprised you the most about that, or, or what did you dis what discovery surprised you the most when you were doing research for your um, any of your books? Um, I know that um, you know people always try to have little contests online about the most obscure or gory thing that they discovered, um, and I know that you guys have some fun things tucked up there. So, Makia, there must have been something about the Black Plague that there must there must. So I remember. Um, so many, I should have brought my notes. But when I was a kid, I'm a giant germaphobe, but I love reading about diseases and gross things in books because books are safe. Books are, you know, they, ugh. So I love going back into history and looking at the, the nasty medical technology of the Middle Ages or even the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. pandemic. So back in 1918, one of the symptoms of Spanish flu was that they, their eardrums would get enlarged and people would just, their ears would start to hurt. So a doctor would have to go in to alleviate that pain and stick a needle right there in a person's eardrum just to burst it as a way of alleviating that pain. And I've just, I learned through research just countless gross, fun things. I mean, the, um, the Middle Ages, they were just so filthy. I mean, I just, or they didn't know back in the Middle Ages that plague was spread from fleas um, that were on the back of black rats. They, they, they thought it came through the air. Um, and because the Middle Ages was kind of dirty, they didn't bathe so often, there were a lot of black rats. There were a lot of fleas. And so just finding those little tidbits of grossness it's just the kind of the kind of books I love to read as a kid and now. Totally, I remember reading about that in the pub in like a public health class, like how they were able to trace it to the sanitation in rats. Anyways, Stacy, you got some stuff up your sleeve. I know you do. Oh, okay. I found out some interesting and kind of gross Titanic facts too. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I maybe, you know, for the day it wasn't gross, but for our standards, it was kind of gross. In the third class, there was only one bathroom, one bathtub, sorry, one bathtub for all the passengers, for the thousands of passengers. 
Um, and I guess people didn't really need to bathe. You know, they would get clean before they embarked on the journey and then they could last a week without taking a bath or anything. So that, that was fine. Um, another thing I learned is that in the third class, they, the, the males had to be separate than the females. So the males had to be on the front part of the ship and the females had to be on the back half of the ship. And there was no mingling because, it, you know, they were very paternalistic. Like, oh, if there's mingling, that might lead to babies or something. So, but the funny thing is that they didn't require this at the first class. So it was just the, the third class that they did not trust. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Anybody else? Sure, so I have a very quick thing, and that is that I never, never thought that I would find people who fell in love in my family and got married kind of uh, on the sly, but, you know, climbing the stairs has a little romance, and I discovered that some people in my family were up to, you know, not my mom, but... <laughs> Kathleen? Um, well, I don't... There was a lot of gross things that happened, but there was something that was really funny that struck me is when I was researching on some of the movies that were there and my mom had talked about it and, and what her papa really liked was the Three Stooges were very popular in Japan <laughs> before um, World War II started. And it was just kind of fascinating to me that something like that at that time period would get over to Japan. So I, I just found that so amusing. I, it's not gross, I'm sorry, I can't really, but um, I just thought that was extremely odd and funny. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else? Amy, Kylie? I didn't find anything I would say that was funny or um, interesting. I mean, a lot of it was just very painful to unearth, um, but I will say that I had a new appreciation for the females in my family. Um, my aunt, who, when I met her, was ornery as hell and just, you know, always grumpy. And, um, but I got to understand that grit and that tenacity and being the, the maternal figure, you know, the, the oldest female, um, what burdens she had on her shoulders to become hardened that way. And it made me appreciate my elders a lot more. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, there's nothing, I mean, that's, that's one thing that history does is right. Right. It, is that it crystallizes how good you have it in the present in some ways um, while also allowing you a mirror to see some of the more scary parallels. And um, I, I think, I think that it's definitely uh, one of the challenges that I'm looking forward to in, in my own trying to do something historical. Um, I guess my question as a writer to you guys, I'm, I'm just asking you to make everything really easy for me, right? Um, so do you ever, Stacy kind of already touched upon this, you know, when she talked about how she made, wanted to make her characters independent. And some people thought, oh, that it wasn't real, quote, realistic. When do you find, when else do you find yourself pushing the boundaries of like history? Um, and because it's historical, but it's also fiction, right? Um, were there any times where, um, where you had to make editorial decisions to, to fictionalize things? Um, and Stacey, I know that you you did have to work with certain real life characters and look at the Titanic, for instance. Yeah, um, absolutely. And uh, the thing with writing uh, such a well known subject matter as the Titanic is that there are rabid fans, and they are like a lot more than my, any of my other books. There are people who just know a lot more than I know about Titanic, and will call you out if you get a detail wrong. So I was very very aware of those that audience out there. And um, so every, I mean, we're, we're faced with those decisions all the time. How much of the, his, where's the line between the fiction and the history? Um, but I was ever more aware of that when writing this story, because I knew how many people were so invested in the history. 
Um, that said, there, there were some timelines I did have to budge a little just so I can get all my story in. And, um, and I think that's probably where I took the most liberties is, um, you know, a lot of stuff happened between that Titanic took a couple hours to sink, but I needed more than a couple hours to get my story in. So I did take a few liberties there. And it's one of those things I'm aware of. I'm sure a Titanic expert would be able to figure out, oh, they couldn't have gone upstairs and downstairs and, up and done all this stuff in that time allotment, but. Totally. Uh, Makia and Kylie, I definitely want to hear sort of about specifically historical fantasy. Like, did, what were the conscious choices that you were made to leapfrog off the history into the fantasy? Like, how did you put it all together? Sure. So my first book was pure historical fiction, the 1918 Spanish flu. And I remember um, writing a background document on that because I didn't want to get called out on my facts. I, I wrote that book like it was a thesis. I was prepared to defend it. If I saw a bad review, I would say, no, I am right and you are wrong and I can prove it. But with my second book, with um, Isle of Blood and Stone, now this is historical fantasy and this is a book based on medieval map makers um, who lived around the Mediterranean. And with that book, I wanted the history part to be accurate. So the history around medieval map makers, around map making technology of the 14th century, around shipbuilding and um, traveling in the 14th century, that, that is accurate. Um, but I wanted the freedom to throw in sea monsters and I wanted the freedom to throw in ghosts in the forest and do all kinds of fun things, and, you know, because, and just call it fantasy. I wanted to have a little more freedom and a little more fun with this, with this second novel, so. Very fair. Kylie? Um, so I guess for me, a lot of my story is just pure fantasy, like Reapers and Shinigami, but there are some things that sort of bridge the gap in some ways, because there's a lot of folklore. Um, in my story, and I mean, a lot of those, I mean, <laughs> you could argue it's more fantasy, but it's still like, you know, oral tradition that's been passed down, you know, in different places from different, um, from different areas of Japan. And so I had to, my editor asked me to sort of go into more detail about a lot of those um, yokai in my book. And as I was reading about them, I realized that there's so many different versions depending on where the story is coming from and like when it was told. So when I was thinking about that, I sort of ended up blending them together into my own version that I, I made sound a bit more flowery than what is probably actually <laughs> how people would say it just so that it's a little bit spookier. So that's probably where I took the most liberties. I tried to stay pretty close to things I had actually read, um, but there is definitely some, some things that I have added just for the sake of baking it more more engaging, you know, if anyone says anything, I, I always think, well, there's so many different versions of the story anyway, you know, what, what even is the real one? Cool. All right, so we're close to wrapping it up, unfortunately, um, but I wanted to end um, with one of my favorite questions, which is, um, what is your favorite um, piece of reader feedback that you've ever gotten? Um, and Kylie, I know your book isn't out yet, so this is unfair for you, but, um, think about the people you who have read it, you know, your, your beta readers, your editors, your agent, what is the, what is the thing that someone said that make you think, this is why I'm doing this? I will say that um, a lot of Vietnam War veterans have reached out to me and uh, told me how healing my books were for them. And so I think that's, that um, just amazing. I, I love hearing from my from my veterans um, and getting their perspective. And when I wrote my second book, one of the veterans who read my first book actually gave me permission to um, publish his poetry, his poems that he'd never published before. So you know, making those connections is the most beautiful thing. That's wonderful. Makia. So my first book was about. Um, but Spanish flu again, was about a 17-year-old girl who volunteers for the American Red Cross um, with nurses and doctors in an emergency hospital. 
And my first letter was from a 16-year-old kid, just a high school student, who said reading that story, um, even though Cleo Barry was a fictional character, um, Cleo was a role model for her. Cleo made her want to grow up and become a nurse, which just was just mm. the sweetest thing I've ever heard. So it was just, words matter, your stories matter. So you just, it was the first time I realized how important storytelling and words were to other people. I love it. Kathleen? Um, one of them was from uh, an in-person thing that I had done at a school and the girl came up to me and I asked her her name to sign in the book and she said, well, I'll have to give you the name that my mom said I have to use. And she said um, she recently moved to the States and she was from one of the Eastern uh, Bloc countries. And she said, when I read the book, she said, you know, I know what it's like to lose people. And she looked at me and she says, I've lost a lot of people, but your character, your mother gave me hope that my story will matter no matter where I am and I can still be me and um, that I can get through it somehow. Um, and, and that just, that'll stay with me for a very, very long time. It was very touching to know that something that my mother went through that she tried to hide for so long um, could mean something to somebody else. Aren't in-person events great? Like I can't even believe how much I miss that, how much I miss those connections. Me so, too, me too. Great thing for us to be looking forward to in the next few months. Stacy. Um, I, I think, for me, it's the readers who, okay, two. Um, it's the, the readers who say they didn't um, think that anyone would be interested in their stories as writers. And so, and enabling um, young people to actually pursue their passion um, as, a, as a career. And then the other is I was surprised by how many teenagers um, reached out to me who had, who did not, who did not know about their culture either because they uh, were adopted or um, they came from cultures where, you know, they just didn't learn a lot about their culture. Maybe they were like more like fifth generation or whatever. And so being able to reach that audience and um, understand what it means to them to learn a little bit about the history of Asian Americans in the United States was quite special. Yeah. Love that. Kylie? Sorry, okay. Um, so I, tr I do read Goodreads sometimes. I try to stay off of it, but I have seen a little bit of very early feedback. And I guess one thing that really makes me happy is when people talk about how much they like Ren, the main character of my book, and how much they care about her, which is interesting to me because I wrote her to be a very unlikable character, someone who's really angry because of the way that she's treated. And she explores that throughout the whole book. And the fact that so many people got that, that they didn't just think, oh, she's a terrible person, that they can understand why the way she why she is the way that she is and how hard she's trying to be something different it's just the world around her is making things hard for her um that makes me really happy that people get that because that really was the point it makes me feel very validated in, in having written her that way i love it and padma um i think i'm gonna also tell i say two things because like amy when amy was speaking i thought about this um I had a whole bunch of people who were not my target audience at all, because of course we're all writing for young, or at least most of us writing for young people. I had a lot of veterans who had served in the allied forces and were in the British Indian army write to me and say, you know, thank you for telling our story because it hadn't been told before and they were just so happy. And that was huge for me. And um, the other thing that happened, which was just, mind blowing. And I think that's why in spite of all the difficulty uh, of writing, I have persisted was a young Latina woman. Um, you know, a few years after I had written uh, Climbing the Stairs and uh, I was, you know, 
having all sorts of issues with my second novel being getting lots of awards, but then going out of print. And I was really depressed and thinking, God, should I quit? Uh, walked up to me and she said, hey, uh, I just wanted to let you know that I went to college after reading uh, Climbing the Stairs. And I'm, to me, that just meant so much. And I think uh, that's what I always carry in my heart is just that fact um, that, you know, that can happen. And um, I do want to say, Eileen, you were very kind to introduce us all. You are also an incredible award-winning author. So I just want to say, I am so honored to be here with you. Thank you for moderating and thank you for like saving lives and being on the front line in this pandemic too. Because you've thank been you. doing that. I, I, I actually, that. Um, I, I thought the panel was on Thursday. So I actually forgot I was on call. So I did get a couple of texts during this that I forwarded to my colleagues. So I guess I'm not saving lives tonight. I'm like, you do it, you handle it. So, but thank you. Thank you, Peb. <laughs> it, hey, it books so save lives too. It's so fun to to wear this hat again and to be with you all. Um, and so I guess we will formally wrap up, but we'll have an after party. Sorry, guys. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, don't, everyone. And don't Thank forget you. To, to go to asianauthors.com. Um, um, Asian Authors. Asianauthoralliance.com. Um, and uh, I think there are only a few panels left, but they're all being recorded and they're all available in perpetuity. So you can watch it over and over again, just like Titanic. Yes, <laughs> on their YouTube channel. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you so, so much. It was so great to be with you all. Yes. Have a great night. <laughs>